high school superintendent before I was there, and you know, the fair view and whatnot, but he was Rotarian as well, so I figured he'd be a good guy to call for the program. Now I introduce Dave Daly. <laughs> been a few years before I've been to a uh, Rotary meeting. I can remember coming up here and making up different dates uh, when I was down at the Antwerp Club. And a little different, not as big, but uh, it's kind of something that we all go through with any organization. It's hard to get it. Like what Bruce said, trying to bring in new members, it's, it's tough anymore. Just trying to get that new generation coming in and taking on the task of doing things for the community. So uh, I feel your pain there. And, but all organizations are, I think, going through that nowadays. Jake asked me to come to speak to you, and I'm, like, oh, I'm not sure. I'm tired now. I'm not doing a whole lot except running after the grandkids, doing different things, keep them busy. But um, one of the things, looking back on, we talked a little bit about some of my involvement other than being in school. Uh, I was there at uh, Antwerp for 26 years, and then went on to, uh, to uh, Fairview for eight, and then I was with the uh, Western Buckeye ESC, which takes care of Paulding and Van Wert County schools uh, for two years, and then I said, that's enough. COVID hit, and it was time to, to do something else. But some of my other interests uh, came about while I was superintendent down at Antwerp. Um, I have a background in, I love hunting. Uh, my grandfather, my dad, my uncles uh, got me involved when I was a, a kid. I, I really didn't catch on to fishing because you had to sit too long. And I was too active, wanted to get out and get involved doing things. So hunting was always the thing that I got involved with. Uh, when I was at Antwerp, though, my, my son became of age that I wanted to get him started. And at that time, uh, they started with the program of hunter education. You had to take a course in order to get a license. But looking around, we couldn't find anything in the Antwerp area. You had to travel somewhere to, to get it. And with my schedule, it was hard to find that much time to get out and, and, and find a course. So we did bring a course in. I talked to a few guys from Paulding area, and they came over to Antwerp and gave a course. And after that, I talked with the, the conservation officer of Paulding County and said, you know, I can't complain if there's no one around if I'm not offering to do some help. So, so I talked to him about getting certified, and eventually then that year I became a certified instructor. Put together a team, and, and since uh, about 88, we've been teaching classes uh, in Antwerp at the Conservation Club. Matter of fact, we have a class coming up this Saturday. But uh, there again, it's changed quite a bit since the beginning. We'd average 20 to 30 kids in a class uh, now, it's hard to bring them in. It used to be where you'd have, you had to have at least 10 hours of teaching and instruction. And so they'd have maybe five nights during the week that everybody had come. With everybody's schedules now, it's hard to get people to come for one day. So we've done a number of things to get it uh, worked out, but we just don't have the numbers coming in like we used to, more for the fact that the state has looked at that and said, all right, we've got to come up with something different. And now they do an online course. And if you're 12 or older, you can take an online course. It doesn't really knock down the hours that it takes. Uh, we're, this next Saturday, or this coming Saturday, we'll be going from nine to five. Well, the online course, I took the online course just to see how it was compared to ours. And you still put in over eight hours going through all the videos and different things. So it's not a time saver but you can kind of do it as you have the time. And so that's made a big difference. So kids 12 and up, so we don't see as many of the older uh, students, but we still see some of them that are under 12, which is its own challenge. But, uh, but it's, it's a, a different area that we've gotten into and, and it's kind of a sign of the times. After I became an instructor, <clears throat> you know, this thing just keeps growing. Once you volunteer for something, everybody starts coming towards you. Well, could you volunteer for this then? Well, the state then came to me and they started a program to uh, teach other adults to be instructors. They call it their cadre program. And I was one of the original uh, volunteers to become trained in, to that program. And what we do is uh, 
uh, in two weeks, we'll have that course down in Finley. And we, anybody that wants to be a hunter ed instructor signs up, has to go through the background checks and all that. And then they come to us for the weekend and we teach them how to teach others the program. And we give them all the ins and outs and all the paperwork, uh, how to go about the best way to, to teach kids, how to reach them and get them to understand and so forth. And so that started up. Uh, then also I was involved with helping the state rewrite their program. Um, after so many years, they like to redo their manuals. And so I was involved, I guess because I was in education, they, allowed, they asked me to help them out with reading levels and different things like that. But now the, the new programs that they have uh, are national. It's more of a generic type. Because if you take under ed in Ohio, that is good in any other state in Canada. So they went with a, a national type. After, now, after that came about, in 2004, I got a phone call from this, the uh, division, and they wanted to start a new program called NASP, National Electric in the Schools Program. And Hicksville is one of them that has that. It's doing very, very well. Uh, they wanted to start out with 10 schools in Ohio as a pilot program. And they they asked if, since I was superintendent, could we get your school and be one of them? And so we, they explained it to me. And I said, yeah, we have an out. We just moved into the new building. And I said, yeah, we've got a place outside that's really be a good spot for it. And they said, oh, no, no, no. This is for indoors. Instantly, I'm sitting there thinking, all this time and money went into a brand new school. I can see arrows stuck in the bleachers, in the wall, on the floor, the gym floor. I said, oh, well, I don't think that'll go. They said, no, 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 it's, it's designed for indoors. So after going over all the, the, the ideas of how it could work, I said, all right, we'll do it. And I had to go through a week's, a whole week of training to be an instructor to teach here again, other adults to be instructors, which basically is your phys ed teachers in each school. We've got a number, a lot of the schools in the four county area are all part of it. Hicksville is one of them that does very, very well. They go to competitions. You've probably seen their names in the paper. Uh, Fairview, Stryker, Montpelier, uh, a lot of them up in that area all do it. And it's really a nice program. It's not just to think about going, you're going to take this, you're going to learn how to shoot a bow and go out and hunt. It's a lifetime sport. And this is one that we found that kids, when they found out they were going to do that in phys ed, we found their attendance rate went up, discipline issues went down. I had bus drivers tell me when I was over at Fairview, they said, you know, Johnny over here really is a problem, but when archery comes around each year, I have no problems whatsoever because they know they get their name turned in they may not be able to participate. Uh, parents were excited about it because you get different groups working together. It's not just a football team or basketball or softball or volleyball. It's, it's not just high school or just elementary. It's all groups working together. One time I was watching a practice and we had um, the kids lined up on the line. They shoot about 10 yard distance. And there was a big football player, huge kid, we had on the team, there was a senior. He's standing there, and right beside him was a sixth grade girl. And he's kind of leaning over asking, well, how'd you do that? Mm -hmm. And you know, the kids would interact, and it was really neat to see them do that, and it really developed some, some good camaraderie around the school at that time. And then we also had parents getting involved, doing things at home because they saw their kids really enjoyed it. So they took it up, because what you use, uh, NAS developed a or had um, Matthews Archery, if you're familiar, if you do any archery shoot. It's a very good company uh, that developed this bow that anybody can shoot. Uh, if you go out and try to pick up a bow to shoot, what they have what's called draw weight. When you draw back, it takes so much poundage to pull back to get it to where before you release. Well, with these bows, there's no draw uh, weight assigned to it. It goes anywhere from 10 pounds to 20 pounds. When you're hunting, it's usually 50, 60, 70 pounds. But the, a kindergartner can shoot the same bow that a senior could, or an adult could. You just adjust it a little bit. And so the families were seeing that they could do that as a family, they had one bow and they could all use it. So we found out a lot of success with that. Um, 
but that's an ongoing program. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not just national now. They have it overseas. It's really growing and, and becoming very, very popular. But here again, Hicksville is one that goes to a lot of the state and national meets. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a great program, I think, to get kids involved with. Uh, so those are some of the things that I've gotten involved with outside of education, uh, continue to do it. Uh, it. It's just fun to try to get kids involved in doing some things, getting them started out the right way and keeping them safe as, as much as possible. So those pretty much are the, the things that, uh, that I'm kind of working on on the site. Also, with your, with your fines and things, Bruce, if you have a special category you're really trying to raise a lot of money for, I've got a lot of information with Jake. Okay. So he can probably fund yeah. several of those for you. Uh, so you need anything, just holler. We've got a few years' experience with him. We'll carry through. But other than that, um, trying to work with the, the, the state on um, doing things. Oh, one thing that to get a lot of their money, you know, through license sales, things like that, helps do conservation work and so forth. But they also, with volunteers, every hour that I put in on doing some type of volunteer work, I have to report. And then back in 1937, uh, the federal government passed the Pittman-Robertson uh, Act. And what that does is put a tax on every piece of hunting equipment, archery equipment, and fishing equipment. And that tax they collect then federally, and then the states can try to see how much of that they can get back. And to get that money back, they use volunteer hours. So every hour that a volunteer puts in on doing something, that they get about $40 back for that. And then that money can be used to provide their educational programs, like Hunter Education has free of charge for the kids. Uh, they do a lot of uh, things uh, out in the communities for fishing and hunting and, and trying to teach people how to get involved, things of that nature. So the volunteer work does pay back. It does bring money into the state from the federal government to uh, offset a lot of these programs. So that's yes. Questions? Yes. I have a question. What's that legal age for kids bow hunting or... Uh, a lot of times you have to kind of watch. Uh, when I grew up in Canada, you know, there's different providences. I have like maybe 16 or something of that nature. Ohio, there's no uh, age limit. And that's pros and cons. You know, I, I don't always agree with it. But they do have to pass the 100 course to get a license. But they do have now what's called an apprentice license. You don't have to take the course. You can get a license, but you have to hunt with an adult, somebody that's 18 years of age or older. Uh, that used to be you could do that for three years. So if somebody wanted to take their child hunting, but they, they didn't think they could really handle the course. The course is designed, we tell the parents that the reading level is about 10, 10 years and up. Um, it's hard on the test, the kids understand, you can tell they understand the coursework, but to take the test, it's tough because the reading material over here, answering on an answer sheet over here. Now in schools, you know, it's about till third or fourth grade before they get up to that point where they're transferring that. And it's hard for, you know, we don't think of it being hard, but for a young child to read something here and then remember it's A over here, you know, until tomorrow. Uh, so a lot of parents, if they feel their child isn't ready for that, they can't get an apprentice license. It was originally just you could do that three years, and then you're out unless you pass the course. Well, with special needs children and things of that nature, uh, I got looking at it and said, some kids just never will be able to do that. And they would never be out without an adult with them. So now you can get an apprentice license forever. Uh, the biggest, the only difference is that you have to be with a licensed adult to make sure you're doing the right things, and you have to be right with them. You can't drop them off at the end of the field and you go down to the other end of the woods and, and hunt. You have to be with them. So there's no age requirement. In Ohio. Yes. Well, young man in our church at 
Uh, Doug Archer here next to, uh, I don't know how they hit anything with those bows. I grew up with sights on my bows. Yeah. Well, the, the reason they, the, these bows, on what he's talking about, these bows, you cannot have anything on them. You can shoot naturally. You can just go back and you have to try to gauge where you are by using something on the string or the riser or something and shoot. The reason for not allowing sights and, and all the other gadgets you can get with archery equipment nowadays is cost. They didn't want kids to compete against others that were really, you know, the more wealthy could go out and put all the bells and whistles on something where the kids that are disadvantaged, and you know, you look at other other areas down southern Ohio, some of those kids, you know, there's no way they were going to be able to do something. So they kept it as generic as possible to make it across the board fair for everybody. Do they still have a, a field test for the hunter safety buses? No, no. Um, for they don't allow you to use any live ammunition. Uh, we do have firearms that we have now. I was able to get a grant that we bought five firearms uh, from Remington that have no firing pins in them. That you can't use them even if you put ammunition in it, it wouldn't fire. And so we do have some firearms there that we do show the kids how to carry uh, in case you're with a group. How to, you know, there's different carries you can use so you aren't sh pointing the, the barrel at somebody, uh, things of that nature. But uh, the state, when you get into legal issues, you have to be careful what all you're teaching them, how you're teaching them to make sure they don't come back because there's an accident. But we do try to teach them the safety factors. We don't teach them how to hunt, but the safety factors that are involved. Yeah, we had to walk down a lane, we had to cross the fence, those kinds of things. We do those things, but in the classroom. Oh, okay, very good. Yes? So, uh, you're a hunter, so what's the biggest animal you've ever shot? I just wonder. Because there was a dentist over at Antwerp. And man, yeah, Don Gricker? Yeah, he'd shoot everything and anything. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I've got quite a collection. Um, Grizzlies? No, I'm not Grizzlies. That's out of my price range. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've got 10 black bears, but um, moose, uh, elk, bison. I know he went to Florida, not moose. Florida, Africa. Yes. He shot an elk, and I think it's something else. Yeah. You can see most of his collection over at Grable. Yeah. They, they have mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. there. Story. Yes. Well, when they do that apprentice thing, it sounds like they've got to do it for three years. Well, it used to be three years. You can, let's say that you had somebody that you wanted to take out hunting that had never hunted before. And, you know, they have to take, even adults have to take hunter education to get their first license. Well, they aren't real sure. They want to invest that much time into it before they go out. So you could go ahead and get them an apprentice license. They can try it out. And, yeah, I enjoy this. All right, now I'll take the course and go ahead and get my license. Or let's say that uh, you want to—it's a younger child and you want to kind of get groom them yourself and go up through. And it used to be they thought three years was plenty of time to find out if they're really going to take on to hunting to, to go ahead and get into the course. Well, with like I said, with special needs and different other situations, now it's endless. You can you can get it every year. Okay. But if you want to get your own license and go that route, do the apprentice thing, I assume after, if I understood you right, you can do it for three years and then you can get a license and hunt on your own. Yes. So you are you required to have so many hours in the field? Or no. No. No, there's no requirements. Or? No. There's no requirements no. For whatsoever. So you just have an apprentice. Yeah. You could potentially have an apprentice license for three years and then yeah, for 30 years. <laughs> yeah, but I'm talking yeah, about right. to get a license. Yes. <laughs> the only thing is, no matter who it is, an adult or a child, they still have to be with a hunter that has a license right. that's taken the course. Right. So they're right there with them. Basically, to make sure they're carrying the, the firearm properly. Uh, they aren't uh, jumping over a fence. They aren't you know, doing something with their firearm that's going to cause potential an accident of some type to themselves or other people. 
Yes. Any questions? I tell you, uh, volunteers of any kind, and you people appreciate this, the time that Dave's put in on this thing is just amazing. I mean, the volunteers to do it. Fairview also, he didn't say a lot, but Fairview's got a premier program over there that really had some outstanding success. Uh, if you watch the Crescent, you see them there all the time. They were really good. But I appreciate and I thank you, Dave, for all the time that you've given to this worthwhile endeavor. I was thinking about that when you were talking about this. Like, when Turk and I grew up hunting, our dad's the one that got us started. What we would have done with a guy like you, Steve, <coughs> is you would have been walking out in front of us. I'd have known better, though. I took the course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've you been walking out a little bit in front of us, you know, so. I'll hey. walk your shirts. I'll walk your shirts. <laughs> I just winged him. I didn't take him down. We didn't want to be took the ball. Didn't want him. Nah, that was his fault. <laughs> that was a well kept secret one. Yeah. Anyways, thank you, Dave, very much. Thank you, Jake, for bringing us the program. Uh, we'll stand and uh, be dismissed by the pledge.